Ladies and gents, welcome back uh, from the break. Sadly, we reached the, uh, the very final session of the 14th Eurasian Media Forum. Uh, and as much as that is something sad, we want you to be happy. But how? That's the big question, isn't it? So uh, we're essentially happy that you came along, and uh, we've, we're going to have you take part in this, uh, this final session, the eighth uh, panel session of the forum, where we take a look at life in a simplified world. And for us uh, moderating, we have a wonderful woman who's definitely going to put a smile on your face. So I'd like the president of uh, CPAC, who's coming from Canada, Catherine Cano, to come up. Catherine. So technology has brought extraordinary changes and advancement, opened us to a new world, being able to communicate anywhere, anytime, amazing opportunities to be more informed and connected with the rest of the planet. Automation makes some aspects of our lives easier. Some will say we get, we're becoming lazy and will improve in, uh, it, uh, for sure in certain areas, like if you can just think about healthcare. But at the same time, with the development of technologies at an increasing speed, we are now in a constant state of change. There is no normal anymore. There is no stopping it, stopping it either, it seems. And the impact is already felt. Automation has meant, has meant people are losing their jobs. Some crafts are disappearing. And then is technology creating a bigger divide between the haves and haves not? So we are more informed, but are we better informed? We are more connected, but do we communicate better? Is there a danger to become addicted to technology? Has technology become the new religion? Is the development of machines making us less human? And when robots become smarter than us, what will happen? Should we panic or be optimistic? We will be busier, busier for sure, but we'll be, we will be, uh, or will, will we be happier? So uh, let me introduce you to our extraordinary panel this afternoon to actually address all those issues and try to give us some, some uh, insights about what we should be expecting for the future. So let me introduce you to first Gert Leonard, who is an uh, extraordinary futurist and humanist. He's also the CEO of the Future Agency. He's the author, author of Technology and Humanity leading voice on, uh, on, among other things, digital transformation, cognitive computing, human-machine futures, and AI, uh, big data, automation, name it, he knows everything. Our second guest is uh, a Russian politician who ran for a uh, Russian presidential election in 2004. She was elected a Duma representative from 1993 to 2003, uh, a former minister of government, she also is an author of a book, uh, How to Survive as a Woman in Politics, a publicist, a business, and a coach, Irina Akamada. Welcome. Next are uh, a very impressive man, uh, Jacek Palkiewicz, I hope I pronounced this right, sir, uh, an explorer and an author. Uh, he, uh, just to give you an example of what he's done in his life, which is amazing, he crossed the Atlantic alone in a lifeboat. He led an expedition to the coldest place in Siberia. He led another expedition to uh, the Amazon and established the actual source of the Amazon River. He trains cosmonauts. He is author of more than 20 books. So welcome, Jacek Palkovic. <laughs> and last but not least, an American living in Paris, David, David Applefield, is a special representative for fin the Financial Times. He's a communication specialist, an editor, a writer, a media strategist. He focuses on creative and innovative communication solutions. Welcome, David. And while the uh, panel is getting ready, uh, I also ov obviously welcome questions. So if you want to ask throughout, uh, just raise your hand. We'll make sure to go to you. Uh, we're going to raise some of them, but I'm sure I'm going to be uh, uh, some uh, very good questions you will have. So let's start first. Um, and I'm going to use this so it's a bit more. Can you hear me well? Yeah? Good? So, Gerd. Uh, I think the first question to, um, to ask about, the, to, so we all kind of start from the same place, how fast is the change happening when we talk about technology? Uh, are we, have we seen the most of it or what, is in, what do you think is, is ahead of us right now? Yes, well, I think it's important to realize that we have reached the takeoff point on the exponential curve, right? 
So the things that we talked about for a long time, artificial intelligence, paperless office, autonomous cars, they're finally here or, or starting to be here. Right? I like to say science fiction is becoming science fact. Right? So on this curve, you know, we're right at that point to where it really gets interesting. So we go from four to eight to 16 to 32. And that means basically the world in 20 years will be so vastly different that we couldn't even imagine it in Hollywood. Uh, in other words, we're facing enormous challenges and opportunities. We're gonna solve global problems like energy, water, food, and then we're essentially seeing the merging of man and machine in a way of technology and humanity. Um, so vast opportunities and vast responsibilities, but the next 20 years are basically the action the action point in the curve. You know, on the scale of 100, we're roughly at four. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got a long way to go. So Irina, what, talking about the challenges, what are the main challenge, uh, challenges, actually, I, I'm sure there's more than one, you see with the uh, increasing of technology and the place we're going with technology now? Yeah, Doma, <clears throat> excuse me, I prefer to speak Russian, and it's okay. Uh, that's why prepare your phones, please. Uh, I think that the main challenge of the modern technological revolution that has occurred is the challenge of individualism uh, versus the general mainstream trend because the technological progress that is growing will keep pushing out people from the, from the process of fulfillment. And those will be individuals of various ages. And this is something that we are observing now, for instance, in case of programmers, because they will not have enough time to develop the new uh, capabilities competing against uh, artificial intelligence. And that might result in some disastrous uh, consequences. And this is something that the leader of Alibaba uh, warned about. He said that finally everything might end up uh, with a third world war. And not only that, it could be the war of machines, artificial uh, intelligence and people, as we've seen it in movies. That might be also a revolutionary process of uh, fight between the people who are left without Work, having the, at the same time the chance to live a normal life, but this will not be, make them happy, and uh, they will be fighting against the machines and those people who will be at the leading positions, because within the next years, within the next 20 years, many people will be left jobless, however, they, they will be not used to that situation as they are used to, to work, and they're highly qualified. Everyone started thinking about that, but no one has an idea how to deal with it. I have some ideas, I will talk about it later, but I believe this is a great challenge. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. I'd, l I'd like to ask the same question to you, Jacek, about what do you see are the challenges uh, facing society and civilization at this stage? I can see that we are seeing the revolution of various nature. This is what happened in the course of my life in the past. All the things that happened in my life required lots and lots of ages. And when I'm thinking about the frontiers and the borders, where the technologies are and where is our place, uh, with all of those technologies, it seems unclear. We probably see some borderline, but tomorrow, or if not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, everything will be blurred and it will be completely different because everything changes so quickly. Our life, as we go forward, doesn't seem to have someone wise who would be, who would be able to say something more certain. Excellent. David, do you agree with that? I have a far more positive and optimistic look at uh, the universe in the future. Um, I took some time this morning to uh, visit uh, the Sphere and the Kazakhstan Pavilion, and I, the first thing I saw was a large group of, of young school kids 
uh, who had taken the train from their town of Akto uh, three days across the country to get here. Um, and I saw the wide eyes, I saw the, imag the imaginations, I saw the love in their heart, the belief in the future. And I think that um, the world um, predominantly is uh, young and technology is also, and change is also young. So the question for me is not the technology. The tools are, will always change. We love um, progress. We've always loved progress. We love technology. The question is our intentions. How do we use it? And I believe that using a filter of what human beings really care about, which is connection and being loved and expressing their love and um, feeling p part of something larger, um, I think that uh, with that kind of moral um, filter, and optic um, technology will be and can be and shall be um, uh, used to uh, to to benefit uh, benefit people. So it's really about um, how we use the tools. We can't blame the technology. We can only blame our intentions. But one thing for sure, and Gerda, I think you want to add something to this: is that technology is also. We feel sometimes prisoner of it, right? Because you look, just look at the way we're using our cell phones and, and, and uh, emails and, and the fact that we're reachable at, at any time now. I mean, uh, do we control it as, mu as much as we think we can, or is it because it's addictive? But, but Gert, what are you thinking about that? Well, uh, first I want to say, I, I agree with David, is that I like to say the future is better than we think. <laughs> now, when, when we watch the media, and especially Hollywood, we look at all the movies of robots killing us, and, uh, and, and these, kind of, these are entertaining scenarios, right? But the reality is really quite different. Mm -hmm. right? The reality is that technology has tremendous power in every part of our life, whether it's about medical or machines that can think about ending diseases. Right? What we lack is that technology has no ethics, right? Technology does not give a damn about our beliefs, our assumptions, our humanity. We have to add this to the equation, right? Uh, William Gibson said, uh, technology is morally neutral until we apply it. Hmm. So it is not the technology that's a problem, it's, it's if we don't apply our beliefs and our values, then we're in trouble. Right? But otherwise, technology is a positive force that we need to embrace, but not become. And that there's one essential difference there. So I'm with the optimists here. We need to actually learn how to balance our technology and create clear limits, what we should and what we shouldn't do, because in 10 years, we can do literally anything. Do we, do we feel that we are actually balancing it, that we are controlling it? Irina, I think you want to, to jump in here. Yes, it's for you, Irina. Yeah, you want, you want to follow up on this? I'd like to argue with my respected um, colleagues. It turned out like that, that I was uh, in fact uh, a part of one movie. I played a politician in that uh, film that was uh, a big film produced uh, jointly by uh, Russia and uh, the Fox Studios. It's based on the uh, book of the Russian writer, fantasy book uh, called uh, The Draft, uh, by the Russian writer Lukyanenko. And uh, um, you said that uh, movies are uh, entertaining in nature, but in the fact of Hollywood, especially Hollywood movies, have this misfortune to uh, become, uh, to degrade. Uh, gradually. I'm not going to give you the plot because you will be totally bored, but the main idea is that in the modern technological society, when uh, the uh, cars uh, fly and so on and so forth, everything that you've mentioned, uh, no one knows uh, their future. The, no one understands what the future is, and they are fearful of it because the threats are intangible, but uh, somehow they can feel it. However, 
there is a tower that pops up and that, and, and that tower opens up the door into the future but unfortunately not everyone can make it open up that door you need to look for the special individuals uh, who could do it and they are somewhat different it's not quite uh, understandable how different they are but they are different and the bureaucratic system the political system tries to use the Federal Bureau of Investigations and Special Service, Services to find such individuals and when they find, once they find this individual then all of uh, uh, this individual's connections are deleted he is taken out uh, uh, from the society and he is put into the tower because it's just those types of individuals who can, can make those doors open and, and they have only the first seven days to do it because after that the system suppresses the individual and he's not capable to open up the doors and after that uh, he can open it for others. So you see, this is a very symbolic scenario because we all think various things about the future, but due to the fast uh, advancement of the post, we cannot imagine it, and therefore we are overwhelmed by fears. However, there is a certain number of people, the minority, who live in a different way regardless of their age, and they can open up any door, and they are not fearful. They can establish a style of life when no matter what their state is, they are able to defeat any machine and to have uh, fulfillment. But this is not a story for everyone. And the current bureaucracy and the system of education and enlightenment in all countries, even in the most developed countries in the United States of America, or moreover in those that are catching up, such as Russia or Kazakhstan, are capable of coping with this challenge and giving an opportunity to every person to feel the future on his or her own and to become happy in this future. Therefore, I think that this subject is still has not been addressed. Okay, that's a very good point. David, do you want to add something? Yeah, I would. And I'm, I'm completely sensitive to the issues of, of history and past experiences in many countries in the world and the dangers of, you know, large um, of societies that and and where there's been you know terror and and, and oppression, um, and I was rec I was thinking about when you were speaking about a conversation I had uh, about 20 years ago, and I published a text uh, by Captain Jacques Cousteau, in, and who spoke in, uh, about uh, the problem. He 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 traced many of the problems in in contemporary life back to the invention of the Harvard Business School's uh, five-year business plan. Because a five-year business plan uh, w is a short-term view of the future, and it also corresponds to the political mandate of, of most uh, elected uh, officials. It means we can't be thinking uh, long-term, we can't be thinking about the endurance and sustainability of our societies, and we make short-term um, decisions. And that led me to think of, again, that the answer, I think, to what we're uh, addressing is really education. And when the moral um, question about technology um, is in, re introduced into, into our public school education systems and it becomes part of our, our national dialogue, um, we will see uh, the way that we approach um, um, life and technology and business in a different way. It is happening already. It is changing in public school systems in many countries. And I wanted to just, uh, we've, we've mentioned your book and you have a book as well. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is not my book, but it's uh, called The B Corp and it's how to use business as a force for good. I have nothing to do with the book other than the, the belief that there are, and I can cite, hundreds and hundreds of new companies uh, that are employing many, many millennials who really care about purpose more than profit or products. So I think there is a lot of change in the way we're talking about how to use our technology and how to use our tools. Not having said that, obviously there is great dangers. We are totally consumed 
over, overridden by our, our devices, and if we're not much more attentive, it's true, uh, the, those risks are, are intensified. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're making this point. Which is like, go ahead. I want to add to what the colleague just said here about being an optimist, but my uh, outlooks are sometimes uh, different uh, from those of normal people. So I would like to first say that I'm a champion of the world when it comes to optimism. My life somehow turns out is not exactly within this world that we're discussing, technologies and everything. Uh, as uh, a man uh, all from within. A lot of my life I spent in jungles and deserts looking for the last uh, uh, uncontacted tribes, uh, the very last places that uh, humanity did not yet manage to destroy. So I'm not in a very close contact with these technologies. So I think I can uh, look at it in a more neutral manner. So I would say that in this world, with all respect uh, uh, to the process and everything, yes, everything did change. Because, well, uh, let's say I'm on a yacht in the ocean. I have no knowledge of astronomy because what? I use a GPS and I never learned to use a sextant, how to hold it. And when GPS breaks down, I'm, I'm, I don't know where I'm at, where I'm at. So let me remind you that this world of technology, it's all very positive, it's all, uh, it's all for the benefit. But if we, should a blackout happen somewhere in the city uh, for a night, it's not a panic yet, but there's a lot of fear and tension. So we should also think, uh, that's how I look at this issue in this light. Maybe a quick comment on this, you know, the. It's hard to imagine because uh, roughly 60% of the world is still unconnected, you know. But there are some countries in Africa where you have, we have better internet than water supply. Uh, in, well, quite a few actually. And, but let's imagine, I think 10 years from now, we're going to have 8 billion people on the internet. We're going to have devices, mobile devices, you know, that have a million times the processing power of, of my mobile. It's hard to imagine this, and, and there will be no, not a single part of our life will be left untouched by technology, and there will be no such thing as offline, except for very few places uh, in the world where offline still exists. Right? Off to be connected will be like air. Right? And, and then at that point, we have to ask one simple important question. How do we protect what makes us human, which has nothing to do with technology? Eh? In that world where everything can be intermediated and watched and recorded and uh, so I think that is the key question and that will take a lot of wisdom because we will actually end up at this place. We're not going to go back in time and, and not do this, right? That option doesn't really exist. Uh, it, we're moving on this exponential scale. That's Moore's law that is happening. Right? And how far can it go? Let's talk about that. In fact, when we, we, we're right now just talking about what we live now with our phones and all that. But when you think of the future, uh, what do you see and how fast do you see that happening and impacting on, on the way we are? Well, I think, uh, I think, again, we're at the pivot point. So let's, uh, let's assume we're at four and we go exponential. Then seven steps is 128. Uh, uh, and then 30 steps is a billion. Mm -hmm. right? So let's say 20 years from now, the world will be more different than the last 300 or 500 years. Mm -hmm. The kids of my kids will not know how to drive a car. They will not know what a book is, most likely. It's kind of sad, right? Because, you know, this is my book. Right? But just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this, this will be a, such a vastly different world. And we'll be able to connect directly with that global brain, you know, in a brain-computer interface. And then we have to ask the question, who are we? And who are, what's the tech? Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then we come, you know, so far the moral question of technology didn't really matter because technology was bad. It, it didn't have any power. It was stupid. Right? I mean, just try Siri or Cortana or Google Translate, you know. It's just not really happening. Eh? But when technology crosses the border to having that power, the moral question just explodes. Because all of a sudden, every single time you say, can technology do this? 
fix cancer, change our genes, connect, upload our brain to the internet? You say, yeah, can be done. So then the question is why? Why do we do this? Mm -hmm. And who is in charge, right? Who is mission control for humanity? Mm -hmm. That's the key question. Right? And it's Silicon Valley, of course, right? So what you're advocating is to that human keeps stays in control. D David, you, you were mentioning to me yesterday that you see, and you started talking a little bit about it just now, that you see uh, a movement almost of actually a generation that actually want to start, go, go back a bit and, and, and st take a step uh, back. Maybe not go back, yeah. but take And there a are ways back. of uh, stepping back as a means of moving forward. First of all, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've been in the, in the media business. We've uh, been discussing the role of paper for a while. Paper is dead, newspapers are gone. Uh, now we see that, no, there are certain things that people, human beings, prefer uh, paper for. There has been a movement back to paper in certain contexts, and uh, we see lots of local newspapers are actually thriving. I think in Kazakhstan, there should be a lot more local newspapers. There are not, and vital ones, and interesting ones, and compelling ones, and locally, uh, locally produced, talking about local stories with local businesses supporting them. Maybe the difference will be that they won't be on tree stock or rag stock. Where we have synthetic papers, we have different papers, we have reusable, uh, not only recyclable, but uh, up, up, upcyclable uh, um, um, pr uh, products. So the technology will re-enhance what we as humans um, prefer. Um, other examples are different types of, uh, of, of companies uh, that's producing all sorts of different uh, services. Lots of people do not want to work for and become part of major lar uh, large uh, corporations. And we're seeing that as being that's a, a significant uh, trend. Um, bookstores which had almost the literary bookshop in America nearly disappeared. We were down to about 25 independent literary bookshops across the entire United States at one point, where you could not, I mean, the, 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 otherwise it's hard. You see, a, you see a, a chain store that may have a um, 100,000 titles, but they were all, all those books, 60% uh, of those um, books were written and published, you know, uh, they were written by 10, 10 authors. So we have a kind of a closing down of the culture. Um, but now we see in the last couple of years, people like um, local bookshops. They're mixing, they're being innovative. Yeah, you can, um, you can have your coffee, you can um, talk, you can meet. Uh, I think there is going to be a massive return to, uh, to hum contact and human values because we do know, we do perceive, we do feel the imminent danger of losing our humanity. What replaces a, a physical face-to-face -face meeting, contact, smile, touch, um, conversation? And there's one book I wanted to mention. There's a professor <laughs> at MIT um, called Sherry Turkle who wrote a book called um, um, Reclaiming Conversation. And that really is, a, is quite interesting because she's documented what happens when devices take over our lives. And what happens is that you stop talking, you stop having a conversation with yourself because when you're walking out around usually on your, because your, your devices interrupt you. When you lose that conversation with self, you lose your ability to uh, have empathy and for, for others. That is one of the risks. Yeah, that, that's, that is very interesting. In fact, I want to go maybe to the audience now. Uh, I'm sure you have good questions. And my dear friends, Giles and Shelby, I'm not sure if they're still around, uh, had this question, uh, and maybe I can ask you, uh, you know, uh, ask one of them to ask it about the expectations from technology and how that has an impact on happiness, because we seem to have a lot of, uh, of expectations. Gentlemen? I'm Shelby Coffey, and I'll venture into this, not on the basis of technology, but an interesting question on the nature of happiness, uh, which I got from Warren Buffett, the world's greatest investor, who went from zero to well over $70 billion. And one of the things that he does each year is to have a seminar, or uh, really it's the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting, but he talks for six hours, and elements of philosophy come out, and he had a way 
to measure your life. And he says, are you loved by the people you want to have love you? And I think with all the conversation about screens and technology and other things, that will remain no matter if we go from four to 100 to 128, that element. So I pass that on as a key part of happiness, even in a very modern age. And anybody's comment on it, Gerd, maybe uh, uh, David? What do you have to say? Well, <clears throat> I, I like to, uh, in my book, I have a main phrase that says that happiness cannot be automated. Okay? <laughs> uh, and I think we all agree on this. However, that doesn't stop a lot of people from trying. Right? There are a lot of applications in technology that, it, that are essentially looking to take what we do and put it into a box, into an app. Right? So substituting human interaction with a technology product. Right? That is the primary mission. I mean, you can say that Silicon Valley has spent the last 10 years building substitutes for people. Right? That's basically what Facebook is in, what LinkedIn is, and it's convenient, right? Uh, and I think technology will get so good at building substitutes, like, you know, now you have voice assistant agents, right? Uh, Amazon Echo, Google Home, you can speak to them, this is their words, not mine, like a friend. So this, is, this technologies are now getting actually quite powerful, and my worry is that technology gets so powerful that we forget who we are, and we outsource these things to it. And in my view, the companies are proposing such products should be subject to ethical restrictions of a sort, right? Because they are essentially drug merchants, right? I mean, I confess to using the drug, like all of us, right? But when it gets too good, then it, it just gets too good for us to really control it. This is like, you know, connectivity is a new religion. Yeah? And so, do we need restrictions? Absolutely, because otherwise we are going to forget what we actually wanted. So I, I, I share your optimism, but then I can also see what technology is capable of. I see many demos, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the other day I spoke with a machine for 10 minutes before I knew that it was a machine. And I talked, to, I talked to her, in parenthesis, about the future of Europe. It took me 10 minutes to figure out that it was not a human. Well, I want to get back to that a little later. I think, even now you want to add something to this discussion. Yes, I agree uh, with the way the question was asked, uh, that uh, it's a very hard category today, difficult category, because happiness is not limited by anything, uh, and new technologies are only helping in that, when, and when a person has everything, they can't really make their choice. But I think the answer is already there. Because if you don't look too formally at the Y plus generation, Y plus generation, uh, the people under 25 today, this already is the generation born in conditions of new technologies and in an air of free uh, will in developed nations, they're already demonstrating answers to all these questions. Because firstly, I'm talking about the minority of them. These children do not share the notion of career as success and happiness. For them, those are matching things. These are different things. Social status and money is secondary. Of course, it's quite bad without this, but they only need them to have free will. Free will, live the way you want, and to feel a fulfilled, creative, Person, yes, they are prone to all this, to all the problems that were discussed by all the speakers. They confuse live communication with uh, social media. They may seem there is life in social media, in, when in fact there is no life. Life is only in real communication. But they have also found an answer why, because they are the generation that is developing with the same pace as the new technologies are. Now this generation is trying to communicate live. And unlike previous generations, us, and even uh, those younger than us, they're not interested in the status of a person. They're not interested in one's 
they, they're not interested in their age or not even their gender or sexual orientation. They don't care about that. They're only concerned about one thing, finding the person on their own wave and get that pleasure, get that fun that brings them together. That's why all sorts of uh, groups are developed that go cycling, that uh, fly around to concerts, uh, jointly engage in different projects. Uh, that's the networking that is part of uh, real life. That's the response of the new generation. Yes, they have their problems. Their sexuality stopped being love. Love for them is a is a closed notion, and sex, you know, for them, it's just something you need to like brushing your teeth once a week. Well, preferably you do that every day, but sex is maybe once a week is good. So traditional institutions like family are falling apart. People get married very late. They stopped uh, having children in larger numbers because they chase quality of life and impressions. And the second thing, this new generation is looking for a new God. If you notice that those under 25, in developed nations, they're not so back to the official or conventional religions. They're looking for a God within and a uniting idea. They take things from Islam, they take things from Christianity, they, uh, they are very carried away with uh, uh, Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism. Uh, and those who catch something that resonates with them, they're absolutely happy and given they work very hard. They're very hardworking people. Believe me, I work with this kids. So what should governments do? If a government can't stop that technical progress, we not, none of us can do that, in fact. And if we see a problem uh, emerging, we can't say should or must that you should uh, read the values of a different uh, generation, read paper books, watch classical movies. It's no good. Time will blow it out. But we can create, we can facilitate help with, uh, with the private initiative and government support, infrastructure of happiness for individuals so that there is no minority. Any child born Born in a country, in a state, will have an opportunity to find themselves, find their God, achieve creative fulfillment and achieve corresponding instruments and skills in the form of instruments rather than behavioral models, development of responsibility. Yeah, and that structure will allow to lead a process. If you can't stop a process, you should simply lead it, relying on the new generation. Do you agree with all of this? And, and from, from your viewpoint. <clears throat> It was uh, only said, two words were said, new religion and God. I, I, I want to speak about religion. So that, about that new religion, God, uh, or do we add uh, what? Money it is, has become a God. We live in a world where happiness, in principle, for majority of people, is the God. And if we add to that, majority, most people I know look at the glass with water, at what's the Russian way to say it, half, less, less, than, less than half full, that's a pessimistic approach, of course, but if we live in a world uh, with this uh, pessimistic air, it's uh, a river is a theme. Uh, I don't know where to stop. Or, uh, I'll offer you this story. When once uh, I, I got to live in five star conditions, Bora Bora, uh, heaven and earth, and other descriptions. And I'm talking to a Frenchman who's been living there for 20 years. I ask him, are you happy as a person? He said, well, you know, I can't say anything bad, but, but look, here, all year round, the temperature is at around 28 degrees, day and night. 
day and night, the, the tide and the wave, uh, there's, you always hear the wave, and then there are palm leaves 24 hours a day. And, and you know, it's so stressful for me that it's been, I can, I know I can live it for you here, but then for winter I go somewhere like Paris to relax and then come back to this heaven. David, do you want to hold on? I think there is another question that I'd like to, you'd like to hear about. Yeah, go for it. Lady in red. <laughs> Good day, Union of Lords of Kazakhstan, Dina Suleimanova. I have a brief comment. In early 2000s, Irina Matsonova issued a book called Sex uh, uh, in Big Politics. And being a young student of a law school, I was shocked uh, and impressed by the conclusions that uh, Irina, you made about the experience of how you learned to swim to reach certain heights to reach the very uh, bottom so that you know uh, how you kick off of that to reach uh, hard soil. So maybe now that experience uh, is uh, security for our future success. Maybe we need to achieve some sort of intellectual and moral bottom so that humanity uh, kick starts and goes back to all the uh, ancient values so of grandmother's wedding will, uh, father's watch, uh, simple family things that sometimes give more happiness than artificial intellect and new technologies. Thank you. Uh, let me just quickly answer first. You know, I can tell you societies are managed by institutions and humans are governed by their own using their experience and their subjective uh, vision of their self. So these are somewhat different things. Reaching the bottom, we are, uh, have been reaching the bottom. It's happening in our house. Institutions all over the world, in the United States of America, in Europe, uh, uh, and terrorist wars show that, and an assault uh, a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the war in Syria, the whole world is showing us that politically, uh, po uh, financially, uh, institutions are falling apart in our eyes. Alternative financial systems are growing as an unmanageable uh, uh, market uh, ocean of cryptocurrencies, but it's not there. But when it's done, it will blow up all these banks with all their debt and, and government uh, bailout money and all those uh, reserve systems. The same is true with political institutions. Not a single uh, international financial institution could solve the problem of poverty and uh, super wealth. Uh, uh, pollution of the environment and those uh, who are hungry but may have access to uh, cell phones. Not a single institution could agree about Syria, about Ukraine or Russia, about situation going bad between Europe, America and Russia. Why? I think it's happening because politicians pursue their own interests uh, through the, about politicians in my country uh, without thinking about the world. But the world technologically has become globalized. So any link in the chain that starts moving, it creates a domino effect and destruction goes to toll. We're actually sinking to the bottom. But I hope it won't touch the people because uh, with all this issues falling apart, these young people, they're so... There's such a uh, demonstration with their, with their, with this trend. They're creating uh, these new things. Uh, who knows what the social uh, media will do? Maybe they'll replace politics. Cryptocurrency with time may replace uh, real financial gangsters in the form of investment banks and, and the likes. So this replacement is happening. The question is only that this transition period, we should make sure doesn't kill a creative person, but would rather elevate him to the level, uh, rather raise an average person to the level of a creative person, and that's the mission of governments. But the bottom, it, it, it's, it's almost there. Okay. David, did you want to add something? Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, I think what we're talking about is a, uh, is a shift of, of values. We're talking about a, revolu of a values revolution that is actually um, global. And we're seeing the manifestations of a call for new values in different ways, in different uh, uh, societies, politically and economically. 
But uh, I was uh, at a conference uh, last week in uh, Almaty, and there was the local representative from YouTube. And he showed uh, the huge numbers of the YouTube videos that have been posted that are most popular in this country. And, and he showed a great example of a local Astana uh, bank that had just done a, um, a video that had gone viral and had millions of, of, of views. And what was it? It was a, pic it was a, a, a well-produced video of um, children, maybe six, seven years old, um, with big shopping bags going into a, a local um, uh, department store and filling, running through the, the aisles and filling up the bags with uh, things off of the aisles and then going to the to cash out and can, they could hardly reach the cash register and they put their new um, debit, children's debit card for uh, Kazakhstan. And lots of people applauded because it was well produced and it was a bit uh, humorous. But it really wasn't very humorous. It was pretty uh, uh, tragic. So I think the really the question is, people will use technology ethically, intelligently, with, co with culture, with meaning, with purpose, if we create uh, those opportunities. So we need a new, um, we, and we're getting it, a ge generation of young people who see the world in different terms, who, have, who want to contribute using these tools, because the tools will do, as uh, Gert just said, uh, will do what we um, ask them to do. It's really about in, intention. And the, I just want to finish by this comment by saying, quoting a, a, um, a, a designer and a philosopher and a thought leader in a, in that I've mentioned a few times uh, this, uh, these last two days, William McDonough, who says, he, as a designer and as an architect, um, he starts with, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? <laughs> everything he designs, if, he, if, 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 you, if everything you create and everything you design and everything you come up with and everything you market um, doesn't answer your, the way you answer that question, or then your intentions are, are clear. And I think we need to be thinking about a moral future with the power of the tools um, that we are capable and we know we will continue to uh, create. Excellent. We have a gentleman there who would like to ask a question. Thank you. I think uh, uh, it's quite uh, acceptable that the uh, opportunities of uh, technology is much more than its damages, but I would like to connect between technology and a spread of uh, violence somehow. We know that the small part of technology has changed the trend in the world, and the example of it is, uh, for instance, terrorist groups like ISIS. Uh, therefore, I think technology is very good. The, 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 the broad aspect of technology cannot be seen in the way that the small part of it can change the world. Therefore, I wanted to know how uh, you uh, connect between these two and what would be the challenges of these aspects of human life? Good question. Gert, do you want to take it? Yes, well, as I said earlier, I think that 90% uh, of what technology does is probably a positive force. So our job is not to go back and undo the technology or even prevent it, which would be hard to do, right? but to agree on the framework of how we're going to apply it. Right? So we have agreed on the framework of nuclear power, even though we've had some problems in the past, right? But by and large, we agree that we're not going to throw nuclear bombs very easily. Uh, and it has worked. And now we're going to have to agree on a, on a framework, a, a, a global understanding of artificial intelligence, machines that can think, and of genomic engineering, of changing the human body, body right? And that will be pretty much the same process. Um, it's quite clear that if we don't agree on the global ethics or the global basic rules of this, that will probably not last more than 50 years, you know, because the, the power of technology will make it possible much easier than a nuclear bomb. You know? it's, it's much easier to build an AI, uh, an artificial intelligence, than to build a plutonium bomb. You know? So it requires collaboration, and there are lots of things happening already in this regard. The technology companies have a new organization called the Partnership on AI that is supposed to make sure that it serves humanity. There's many good starts there, and we still have time. And this is why I'm an optimist. You know, I think it requires a moral, legal, 
global framework will force us to collaborate or perish, basically. But technology and, and is quite a powerful tool. So hmm? how, how realistic is it that you actually we can think of controlling this? I mean, it's, it's okay if it gets in, in good hands, but how realistic can we really be? Well, it's realistic to some degree, maybe not to others, but you know, the, the thing is that there's a deterrent to violate the most basic rules. Right? Mm -hmm. For example, the US and the UK want to allow drones that can kill people in the field without human supervision. Right? And all the other countries in the world do not want the drones to make a decision if the four-year-old girl is a, is a terrorist or not. So if that results in, in, uh, in sanctions, and then, then I think we have a momentum to agree on the most basic things, You're like we should not build uh, hybrid beings of man and machine. We will be able to do that, right? mm -hmm. that we should not build it unless there's a medical reason, for example. Right? So there's lots and lots of those debates that are just starting to happen. I think it's a very important question for our future and also for putting humanity over business. Right? Well, yeah, exactly, because the growth benefits a group of people, obviously. What would be the role of governments in that? Well, I think the, the, the bottom line is, uh, just to finish that idea, is that all these things are very, very powerful for business and economy, right? They're driving literally hundreds of trillions of dollars. The Internet of Things, AI, personalized medicine. But they create huge human problems between our society. Uh, and the role of government is to equalize that. I mean, this is the primary role of government, is, is to figure out how to make a balance between those two poles. And I can guarantee you that uh, I think Every politician that does not have an answer to those issues will not be around very long, uh, let's say 10 years or so, right, mm -hmm. time frame, because that is the number one question. How do we harness technology without killing ourselves? David? Uh, uh, there's a, a, a very practical example that even comes closer to our lives in AI and artificial intelligence as the, we're, we see the automobile industry moving so uh, rapidly towards the, the driverless vehicle. Imagine, uh, because this was explained to me, think about this. Um, some programmer, some company has to decide. Um, this is a driverless car. You're driving down the street and two pedestrians, two individuals, two human beings are, are in the road. One's coming on the, coming, walking in, the, in from the right, one's walking in from the left. How does the artificial intelligence decide, and it doesn't have enough time to break and miss both of them, how it will be, the vehicle will be programmed to hit or to miss one. Is it by determining the age of the person, the, the the size of the person? I mean, it is a terrible moral uh, question. Um, I think the questions that you raise um, have to be addressed by our academics, by our moral, our spiritual leaders, by our politicians, by our, our scientists, and it has to be, we have to have a much broader um, national, nationals and international debate on all these issues. These are difficult issues and uh, they're going to affect us quickly, they're and they crucial. are already. They're crucial. The gentleman, I think, or at the end, yes, have a question. Uh, hello, my name is Artur Saudabayev. I'm instructor of robotics at Nazarbayev University. And I wanted to address also the, um, what you mentioned, the frameworks and all these initiatives to control uh, the development and the ethics of the progress. Um, I want to question their functionality because you mentioned very well the, um, the agreement on nuclear weapon usage. But we have multiple examples of massive abuse of technology. It's systematic, basically. First thing we did after we realized there's genetics and how it works was eugenics, uh, sterilization and extermination in three countries. Um, uh, there were nuclear bombs used. It took us some time to understand that probably this is not a sustainable way to do it. Now, um, there is exponential growth and advancement. Um, that's why, to me, I think the most exciting area now is, is genetics, again, sequencing and engineering. Um, and there are initiatives trying to control uh, the process. Uh, but however, there are still ex examples. Two years ago, there was this paper uh, which reported on the genetic engineering on human embryo. And there's rumors that Nature did not accept this paper, so they had to publish somewhere else. And then uh, one of the most prominent researchers in the field, they 
made manifest stating that this is unacceptable and that we are not ready. Um, and the topic today is what makes modern people happy, right? And I realized that there's something in technology which can make me uh, very much unhappy. Um, I submitted my DNA test in California two years ago and recently they gave back my uh, reports on Alzheimer's disease. Shall we know that data? And shall the society know that data in the future? Shall insurance company charge me differently? Shall people not date me on the websites? Shall people not employ me to a job? Shall it be, again become a um, discrimination measure? How do we control it? I know the consciousness transforms, but I would really like you to, to hear your opinion on these matters. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's a minor question. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, basically, I think technology is very good at hedonism. You know, like, uh, if I like your website, you get a feeling for, for 0 0.2 seconds, I've, I've sent you a like, right? Um, I've watched your YouTube video. Um, I have simulated reality. I've traveled to India on YouTube, you know? Those things are fantastic. I, I'm not putting them down. I can study at MIT over the internet, right? And that's all really great stuff. But the, the fact is, happiness is not created in such a way, right? Happiness is created between ourselves and inside ourselves. So my view is that the attempt of technology to make me happy, I appreciate, right? But this is not a question of technology. And, th and this is why, for example, I disagree with the singularity movement uh, that we're destined to use technology to make us happy because there's no such thing. You know, we are essentially not technology. Uh, I don't know if you agree on this. This is a very central question. So are humans just fancy technology, like really complicated algorithms, or are they not? Right? If we're not just algorithms, then the question is clear, technology is just a tool. If we are algorithms, the answer is clear, we're going to become technology. Uh, I think this is the question you're alluding to. Right? So the bottom line is I don't believe that we're just fancy algorithms, at least not for the next 200 years, <laughs> uh, which is why I believe we have to have in like an environmental uh, protection agency for humanity. I, I sometimes jokingly call this the EPA for humanity. Uh, we have to protect things that make us human, like mystery, accidents, mistakes, lies, stories, imagination, intuition, fun, humor, you know. Machines don't understand things that are not in code. And therefore, since I'm not code, they'll never really do what I do. Right? I think this is a very important a basic question, as many philosophers have said, uh, technology is not what we seek, but how we seek. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, Gerd, that the, the technology gets so advanced and the artificial intelligence gets so advanced that they out, obviously you're talking in, in your books that they could outsmart them, us, uh, our brain power in a you know, matter of a decade, could we become irrelevant? Well, I, th I think the short <laughs> answer is that technology will be able to simulate my brain in a computational way you know, 40 quadrillion calculations per second. Every neuron has tens of thousands of connections, and technology can simulate that, right? Mm -hmm. But as Daniel Kahneman said, the world-renowned psychologist, we are not actually thinking with the brain. Right? We think with the body. Our thinking goes on in a thousand channels. And then a computer comes and says, I've got 0.4 of your channels covered. I'm, I'm more intelligent. That's just not the case, right? That machine is very intelligent, but it's far, far, far away from human intelligence, which we don't even know how to describe. Right? There's the uh, Polanyi, uh, Polanyi paradox. There's a Hungarian philosopher who said, a doctor, who said that we cannot automate what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we can't describe how we do them, and how would a machine then learn from that? Right? So I think we're far away from this scenario of artificial intelligence trumping us. You know? <laughs> uh, we will lose jobs because all the routine jobs will go to technology. But that is not going to be a burden for us in the long run because we can, we can move up the food chain. Would someone like to add something? I, I want to just res res respond to this excellent question, a very compelling question, question and, a, and, and a complicated one, but a very real one. And there's a real example. And I'm not a philosopher and nor a, a scientist, but I am, I'm a media guy at a media um, a forum. And I think that the questions like what you raised, sir, um, 
are, re require a media response. I think uh, that the media practitioners in the room, and those who are working in Kazakhstan especially, um, should join up with you. And we need to see radio shows and websites and newspaper columns and television programs that re regularly discuss and sensitize and, and create a, 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 a format for, for national discussion. Um, that is uh, what has to happen. And I think your questions, they were both articulate, poignant, actual, and, uh, and, 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 and terrifying at the same time, um, that should require some kind of call to, to action on, in the media space. Uh, I'm not seeing that yet uh, here, and I think there, that would interest. That's fantastic content. That went, and then let the public um, and uh, users and uh, social media and others uh, get involved in the conversation. If that is one of the things that comes out of this discussion, I think that we will we have served a, a greater purpose. purpose. Yeah. Jason, would you like to add something to the conversation? Давно здесь уже немножко в теме Дон Кишотства, если так. I think that uh, we are somewhat in the area of uh, Don Quixote. I've been in this area for so many years uh, to trying to make sure that there would be something human left in the family, that it wouldn't be uh, the type of things that we see in the media or on TV. I don't watch TV, and that's why when I see an actress who was in this series and she is believed to be a celebrity and so on and so forth, this world is not understandable to me. And no matter how much we discuss this and whether we want to go to the right or to the left, uh, it doesn't seem to be working anyway. Uh, uh, I want to wish uh, success to everyone. Uh, uh, I'm talking so as a champion of the world on optimism, but I would say it's a complicated uh, theme. There are so many interests uh, being uh, crossed here, and it doesn't enable us to change the direction, unfortunately. Thank you, Irina. I would like to add on to that as well, um, answering to your wonderful question regarding the genetic code. There is always some control over the progress, and therefore it's always behind it, because the progress is related to the market. And it comes from the bureaucracy, and control is, comes from the top. It's always about bureaucracy. And we can always be trying to be catching up uh, with it and uh, developing more sophisticated forms of control. It will be part of our GDP, but there won't be a lot of progress. There is only one way to overrun the progress, and that way we won't have such terrifying uh, uh, consequences. That's why I'm trying to say, if we have the infrastructure of uh, uh, shaping up a human personality that would have its own energy to shape up, his or her own life, then what you, that's what you were saying, that the technology is just an instrument, and uh, it's only inside of us that we can be happy with our own body. And then you will have uh, a different attitude to what's happening. You will have a balance, and when you get uh, ill, you will understand whether you need to see a shaman, or you need to see a traditional uh, doctor. You will know for sure that if you've broken your leg, then you need to have some blood stuff. And if you have so, it's broken, and that's why uh, you have all those diseases. You, no one will help you. Sometimes the shaman is a genius, but if you have information uh, done something to any tests and done that that information to any tests and done that the basis for your girlfriend to, uh, to leave you, you don't need this girl. You need the girl who will uh, learn about uh, the most terrifying uh, illnesses that you have, but who will stay with you. Therefore, God thinks that someone licked it and uh, all the people who are poor into you have left you. If you are not self-sufficient, then no code uh, will not be developed yet. Uh, and even if you are not self-sufficient, you will have a fear. 
Но если вы сильная личность, а, и вы заинтересованы в своем счастье, то вам могут врачи сказать, что вы не будете ходить, другие врачи вам скажут, что вы не будете видеть, третьи врачи вам скажут, что ваше сердце не будет работать, а вы будете ходить, вы будете видеть, и сердце будет работать, и вы еще будете заниматься спортом, заниматься сексом с утра до вечера, творить свои картины. Потому что вы, как правильно было сказано, счастливы всем своим телом. Это никак не зависит ни от каких uh, технологий и сливов uh, вашей информации. Поэтому нужно упираться в человека, да? So we should really rely on a person. I'll let those other things go on their own, take their own turn. We have one more question from this lady. Hello, my question is as follows. If you read old science fiction, writers mostly were optimistic about the future in uh, contemporary literature and in culture. Most popular things are anti-utopias anti and post-apocalypses. Maybe it's not the technologies, maybe we're just afraid uh, of what we will do with these technologies. Thank you. My version is we're afraid of the future because we don't see it. The past times, the progress was more sequential, and every person moved in life uh, kind of walking up the stairs, going uphill. Every time you raise your foot, you see the new step. So they saw some prospects in the future. Today, in the life of every individual, it's like walking on a thin rope, because technological progress uh, had uh, disrupted all proportions. You are walking and you may lose uh, equilibrium in any moment. And as a smart person, you want to be happy and you want to maintain balance. If you hurry, you will fall. For if you try to stop, you will fall. So you have to be moving the whole time, but keep on thinking about the future, otherwise you will fall. So this continuous movement is being born again every day. You need to empty yourself at night and reborn in the morning and grab it again. And that's the pace of continuous moving together with an ongoing chaos forming uh, the future and thinking about the future is impossible because it's, in, it's, not, it's invisible and, and it's endless. So uh, there's a very wild swinging uh, imagination and it's always easier to uh, draw apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic pictures. See it? Uh, I think the problem is with, yeah, I can't kind of agree, but the, the problem really is that uh, when I was a kid or starting at university, we could think of the future as being, you know, over the top, somewhere there, right? But today it is, my, my present is somebody else's future or somebody's future is my present. It's all in parallel, right? The future is already here, we just haven't noticed. And, and this is the problem we have to now, if, if you have kids, you know what I'm, I'm talking about, right? Our kids have to think about what is now and what might be tomorrow at the same time. Yeah? And that's what every company has to do that's in business today. You make money this way today, and in five years you make money in this way, and they're completely unrelated. Yeah? And this is how we have to approach the future. We have to come back from the future rather than go into it. And this is also what removes the fear that you can't do anything about mm -hmm. the future. Because the future isn't some, it's a mindset, right? The future is in our minds, it's not some time, right? It's a mindset. Interesting. We uh, have one more question, I think. In the meantime, could I just Who comment, to uh, add to that? Because it, it struck me now that uh, there's a, I think there's a cultural issue here as well. I've noticed over the last couple of days, we, much of the discussion starts with a kind of a, uh, um, a skepticism or a negative approach, or um, a, and it may be historic. It may be because of the political system that dominated the region. Um, and but or 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 I live in France, and I also have noted, uh, you know, on commence avec l'impossible. 
<laughs> and then we work our way to the, to the possible. And the American approach generally is we work everything is possible and then some things don't work out. And I feel that uh, there is a, um, a darker, we're starting with the dark, the dark side and looking for light as opposed to um, seeing really fantastic opportunity both for employment, for, uh, for an eth ethical, um, ec uh, ecological, uh, ecologically improved um, future energy uh, situation as well in the world. There's so much positive technology that is improving lives and giving individuals the power to participate. And I think the, the, imp the what, what is uh, the hindrance and I've worked a little bit now here in Kazakhstan, is that there is a, a hesitation or a resistance to, or a, a lack of self-confidence that the individual can make the world the way she or he uh, wants. And I think that is, so there may be a psychological uh, barrier as well that is, that is hanging over the larger conversation. Be, uh, to, all that are, that, to all that have the issue, I'd sometimes like to say, we are authorized to create our future. Right? We're not damned to some future that somebody else brings along. Right? We are actually creating the future. It's not predetermined. Right? It is there for us to make. That's a very good point. Okay, we have many questions actually. Yes. Good evening. My name is Miras. I come from the Vivata Model Agency. I agree that we build our future. We're here now in the present and we should be optimistic. In this situation, what is happiness for me? What makes modern people happy? If we were to look at Maslow theory in application to this, first of all, it's security and several other elements that uh, uh, provide us basic things for self-fulfillment. That's for the last element. Of course, technologies would give us that and we should uh, have a positive outlook. So let me say, what is happiness for me? For me, happiness is being always with my loved ones. And these are our ancestors, our culture of Kazakhstan. But at the same time, it's also the knowledge and realization that my parents, my grandparents, will always be together. And I would always want for our academics, uh, scientists, uh, R&D experts would do this thing for the future, digitalize us. It would be beautiful if well, we will all live this world one day. None of us are internal. Everything will die. And if my, gran my grandmother can always be in the digital world, I will continue giving me advice, of course. Maybe she can't give me a hug, but I will feel her support. And I think, and yes, by the way, I just want to thank uh, you. I am looking forward to being in the presentation of you because I would like to uh, get your book and read it because I think uh, uh, future must live in our hearts. So we must face the future uh, positively. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. I'd like to take a couple of more questions. We have a few minutes left, so I'll, I'd like to listen to two or three more and then maybe we can have a last word with our panel. Yes. Um, we are living all uh, in a uh, digital world um, and uh, we all communicate through different kind of platforms and uh, you know in my work I have to check all these different kind of applications um, you call someone and uh, they will reply to your slack or you you leave a voicemail and then they will reply to your Facebook um, was my space you and it's, it's getting really frustrating because sometimes you just um, want to you know, receive a simple letter from the person and then from the specific, um, you know, platform and not to get confused. Um, and, you know, people gather and everybody's staring at their mobiles and you cannot even have a proper conversation because they just keep looking to their mobile phones. Um, and people, you know, when you go out, everybody's taking the selfie. Selfie is becoming international word. Everybody understands that, but 
Um, I, I'm not sure if they're really happy in real life, if, if whatever they, fo you know, take um, photos, like whatever they eat, whatever they go, and in their real life, what kind. So my question is, um, you know, how to not to lose your identity in this, um, you know, how not to, how to not to lose yourself, and what's the um, actual line between this technology and actually simple, basic, you know, life. <laughs> Thank you. You want to take that on, David? I think you just need to, uh, I, 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 most people in the room and in the world sympathize exactly with what you're saying. I mean, uh, if you just count your uh, unread emails and, your, and, your, and people, how many pe multiple phones and how many uh, apps you use. I mean, I did a, I did a, a search um, for, I was looking for, to come up with a baseline list of social media tools used by media professionals that, to communicate, market, and remain relevant. And I found that uh, um, one uh, industry leader uh, su suggested 39 social media tools in addition to his Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Google Plus accounts. And there was, uh, you know, the, the Buffer, TweetDeck, uh, Discus, uh, chat, chat Catcher to find the tweets about your blog post, Topsy, the virality tool for tracking your mechanisms, uh, you know, on and on and on. You will go crazy. <laughs> you will go crazy. So we need the self-confidence as individuals, as citizens, as thinkers, as just normal human beings. We need the confidence to be able to pick, pick and choose. The choice is ultimately ours. Use the tools that work for you and turn the thing off. It's, strong, it's powerful. I remember back in 20 years ago seeing a, a briefly. Yeah, briefly, yeah, briefly. yeah, yeah. I just remember a book I saw in a, in a window in Atlanta um, uh, that was pu indiv independently published like 20 years ago, um, four, four arguments for smashing your TV because of the power of television. We're always, uh, I mean, it's never been as intense as now, but there are ways to resist. But we need to tell people, we need to tell um, our families, and we need to tell our kids, and, uh, and we need to tell our students, it's okay to turn things off. We are enough. <laughs> so it is, a, it is a shared common global uh, concern. I'm trying to do that every day, and I'm not it's very hard. successful, I have it's to more say. Powerful Good, very quickly. Uh, a short reply on this, I think, the internet and the smartphone and technology in general uh, are essentially drugs of a sort, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the smartphone is the next cigarette kind of thing. Uh, in fact, they go well together. You can work on the fart and smoke at the same time, right? Uh, but the thing is like any other drug, right? We need some drugs, we need moderation, right? Like smoking or, or alcohol. Some drugs we should never touch and other drugs should be regulated or forbidden. And we have to find a balance there, right? We cannot say, well, it's all forbidden. That would be stupid, right? And we cannot say it would all be loud. Right? We're going to need to find a compromise on, on, along those parts. Like, we should never try, in my view, to connect our brain directly to the internet because we could be faster, you know? I think that that is unethical. Right? But we have to decide on what those rules are together just like we decide them for drugs. And, and sometimes we're wrong with drugs, and, and people do violate the laws, yes, but somehow we have to find the moderation and the things that are not okay, and right? we have to find a way forward. Two last questions, and we have five minutes. Harry. Good evening. My name is Harry Nanda from Toronto. My question to panelists is, do you think that the advancement of technology has reduced our level of happiness. For example, looking at your phone, 100% full battery and a good Wi-Fi connection, we are very happy. <laughs> or has it limited our choices because we go to the restaurants that provide free Wi-Fi rather than a good food? Or it has made us stop enjoying the present moment. You go to see a fireworks show, three-fourths of the adults people are taking pictures and not enjoying the fireworks. They are sitting there live but I don't know who are they saving it, these memories for. Do you think it has negatively impacted our happiness? Thank you. Do we have one more question before we go to the panel? Maybe we'll listen to that one, then we'll, I'll ask the panel to answer quickly. Yes? Well, why don't we answer the, that question quickly. Uh, David, you, would, you want to take I, that? Well, I just was going to say Harry answered his own question. 
I mean, yes, you're on, you're, you're, you're less happy now. <laughs> and I think that um, this is uh, what you were saying as well. You, uh, the, the, we're, we're in a period of, di you know, we're, of disruption. Uh, cha things change. Uh, companies are adding more things. We're, uh, we're, we get confused. We're, if we're not confused and we're not distracted, then those tools are, 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 uh, are that's how they were de designed to, uh, to, to, to be used. So I think, yes, we definitely. Um, look at, look at um, this book about uh, reclaiming conversation, I would strongly suggest. Because what we've, we've seen is that we thought that um, the problem were our kids. Uh, actually, the kids have learned a lot from their parents. Their parents have been a terrible example about not being able to turn off their devices, not being able to keep the family dinners um, uh, device-free, and things like that. Thank you, David. Jason, you want to say? Something. Looking at the youth that spend their days uh, with, uh, with a mobile phone or an iPad, you can't say they're unhappy. They don't have the notion of being unhappy because of that. So it should we should uh, we should factor that in. Excellent. Uh, last question, Christian. Я хотела вот одну секунду. Second, I wanted to uh, uh, jump in. At the time when humanity started riding cars, no one told us, is this car going to ruin your happiness? If you want to be happy, ride a donkey or a horse. The same is true for internet. Internet is not an instrument for happiness. All gadgets and internet live for just one purpose, to get information and to communicate information. Same is true, yoga is now in media. A lot of people looking to their smartphone do yoga, and at that time they switch to meditation. So the question is one thing, teach a young person, set priorities and explain to them how to balance between technology and communicating information and the real life. Because happiness is not online. And it's on offline. But today all the communication is being done online. So that's the difference. That's an artificial question. I think it's something of the past. Because otherwise we'll continue talking about it. Uh, what, what are we going to say in 20 years? There are no smartphones now, but there's a chip. Is that chip making you happy? We should go back to smartphones. Because then at least you could turn it off and or even throw it away. But now it's in your head. Now we're all unhappy. Now, we should bring up with just one idea. Guys, it's a tool. There is no happiness in Internet. There is information, so cheap, free, to do your business, to advertise, to sell your ideas without paying major advertising companies major money. So happy like that. Go jump quickly. Maybe a quick comment on this. You know, technology can make me very happy when I'm able to call my son in South Africa on WhatsApp and it's free, we can chat. That makes me happy, right? It can also make me very unhappy because he may be busy talking to somebody else. Right? Uh, and that is the same question then saying, is somebody who has just taken uh, a, a whole pipe full of crack, is, is he happy or not, right? Uh, and you can say, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, maybe that person is happy at that moment, but it's probably not a very happy lifestyle. So the question of happiness, I agree with you, you know, this is just, technology is very good at simulating the happiness, right? We have all these thousands of friends on Facebook, but they're not friends like we could be friends. We should not confuse the simulation with, with us, right? And that's where the trouble starts. Just like a drug addict, you know, when you, ref when you confuse the reality of the drug with the reality of actual life, you know, that's when you get into trouble, right? So that is the important part. We should not confuse the simulation of happiness with actual happiness. Uh, and that is, I think, the key point about technology. Thank you. Christian, last question, and then really briefly. Um, uh, hello, I'm Christian de Vartavant. I'm the head of uh, um, academic relations in the Decent Foundation. Uh, I just want to bounce on some... I was about to, to, to reply to David, who talked about artificial intelligence and ethics, and you did too. Um, I want to bounce on uh, faking emotions uh, and just attract your attention on uh, and the members of the public about this 
robot, which Hanson Robotics has presented in Geneva at the beginning of the month. This uh, uh, robot with a face of a woman called Sophia. I don't know if you're aware of it. Um, I've seen it. Um, as a scholar, I'm a bit reluctant to talk about it because I haven't checked all my sources. I thought it was a hoax, perhaps, at the beginning. It seems to be serious. So basically, it's a robot with a female aspect. The, the, the muscles of the face uh, actually function. She sees everybody through the eyes. And what is much more worrying, she answers the question uh, such as, what is the meaning of life and other such things. So um, even if it was a hoax, <coughs> Uh, and we're getting there. Um, the question of ethics is, is central to, the, to the, the such creation. And um, I don't think it's a hoax. I've been checking sources since one hour on the net. I just cannot find anything that would suggest that you know, it's anything not serious. And in which case it poses some real ethical problems because so we're reaching the frontier of what Your question, Christian, if, if we may? So what your question is? Um, so that's it. I wanted to relate to the, okay. the ethical problem and how, now that we've reached this frontier, who is going to take on these ethical issues and how are we going to regulate the limitations of artificial intelligence to make us happy? That's <laughs> okay. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. I think, uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, and I want to thank all the panelists, David Hapafil, Jacek Palkiewicz, Irina Hagamada, and uh, yes, I'm mentioning it, <laughs> Gerd Leonard, who has a book signing right after this event. Uh, and I think you're going to have a lineup of people who want to have it. But thank you very much for all your, uh, your thoughts on this subject. Obviously, uh, it's hard to figure out happiness and technology, but I think we did a, a good, uh, we took a good take at, at it. Now, to my old friend and colleague from Al Jazeera, Riz Khan. Thank you. A round of applause. <laughs>